Welcome to the Ottawa International Writers' Festival. Our 2020 virtual season is broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. Hi everyone and welcome to the Ottawa International Writers' Fest. I'm Lucy Van Olden Barneveld from CBC Ottawa and this is quite a unique format, very new to me and uh, and it's, it's quite exciting to try. So thanks very much for tuning in to this very special interview tonight. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, things have been going very well for Emily St. John Mandel. Her 2014 novel, Station Eleven, about a global pandemic, sold over 1.5 million copies, likely way more by now. And in many ways, it changed her life. She was a finalist for the National Book Award and the Penn Faulkner Award, and she won the Arthur C. Clarke Award for Best Science Fiction Book. Her latest novel is The Glass Hotel. It centers on a another type of disaster altogether, not a pandemic like the first one, a massive Ponzi scheme that swept across people's lives and futures like a rogue wave. It is also a turbulent sea where the main character, Vincent, is lost, just like her mother's death years before. And there's also a mystery to solve in the Glass Hotel. Who wrote, why don't you swallow broken glass? That was found on a window in the Hotel Cayette. Emily St. John Mandel joins me now from New York. Hey, Emily. Hello, thank you so much for interviewing me. Oh, thanks for being here. You know, going back to Station Eleven, which let, if we can start there briefly, um, yeah, sure. You know, a book about a global pandemic. So I want to hear what went through your head when you heard that the real world was facing a real pandemic. What, what did you think? Um, you know, I was in shock the same as everybody else, to be honest. Um, what I found myself thinking about was that for all of the, you know, is that you can do really an incredible amount of research into the history of pandemics but that doesn't really prepare you terribly well for the actual experience of being in a pandemic. And what was kind of interesting to me was just uh, you know, getting to sort of field test my research, I guess, and just see what the differences were. And I think the big thing for me is that I'd always thought of being in a pandemic as kind of a binary state. You're in a pandemic or not in a pandemic, you know, the switch is on or it's off. And what I found really interesting was that uneasy interlude, which for New York City and probably similarly Ottawa, uh, was kind of by mid-February, we knew it was coming. Uh, you know, it was very clear that it had left, the virus had left China and it was everywhere. Uh, it was a matter of time. That strange interlude of being sort of in a pandemic, but not quite in a pandemic and still sending your kids to school because after all, you have to get some work done. Um, you know, wondering, well, should I be stocking up on canned goods, but not really pulling the trigger? <laughs> so yeah, that was, uh, that was a state that my research hadn't prepared me for, that, that strange sort of prelude to pandemics, I think of it. Right. Well, Station Eleven, you know, it takes place 20 years after the pandemic and people mm -hmm. are getting along in this new reality. But, you know, I, I'm curious also, though, to, to hear what you've learned maybe about human nature in the last six months, because Station Eleven also told us that at, at, in spite of everything, people will remain good at heart. So do you think that is the case in this pandemic so far? Yeah, that has been my experience, which has been really heartening. You know, I've seen a lot of community activism and people reaching out, uh, you know, how can I help? So many people have lost their jobs in the United States. I don't know what the situation is in Canada, but, you know, the economic impact is devastating. And I've seen really wonderful things like a neighborhood coffee shop that pivoted into being a soup kitchen. Now you can go there and pick up groceries if you need them. Um, so very kind of grassroots things happening, which does speak to a fairly obvious political problem in the United States, which is that I don't think it's really controversial to say there's a bit of a vacuum at the federal level. Um, so, you know, we kind of, to, to understate the situation by a fairly extreme degree, um, so there is an element of having been a little bit abandoned by government and having to do things like invent soup kitchens, um, which is unfortunate,
But, you know, on the other hand, people are doing that. They are helping their neighbors. Mm -hmm. So that's been really nice to see. And then also, you know, I, I do obviously have a vested financial interest in people continuing to buy books. So, um, you know, I'm a little bit biased on this topic, but it's wonderful that people are continuing to buy books and continuing to read books. And I think that points to something that I was thinking about in writing Station Eleven, which is the importance of story and the importance of the arts and just reminding us that there's more to life than just survival. You know, the, the line in Station Eleven is survival is insufficient. And although this real pandemic is not nearly as bad as the fictional pandemic in that book, it's, uh, it's interesting to see that that seems to hold true. Yeah. I mean, you know, as, as we were saying before we started, people are still drawn to, to books, to authors, to writers festivals. People are, are, are still tuning in in droves. They want that. And what has been the response to Station Eleven since the pandemic began? I mean, uh, I, I, the book sales since March, I, I would ima- I, I can't imagine what they would have be what they would be doing. What have um, you seen? They but they've gone up, um, which. I find, okay, so personally, I would not read a pandemic book during a pandemic, but I'm, uh, that's, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a personal decision. Um, you know, it's interesting. The initial wave of responses during that prelude period I was just talking about, you know, or say uh, the month of the month of February, basically into early March, I was getting a lot of blowback on Twitter from people who were mad that I'd given them nightmares essentially. And, uh, you know, it does say on the back of the book that it's about a pandemic. So I had I had somewhat limited sympathy for that stance. Um, but you know, it's been it's been overwhelmingly positive. I wish that this wasn't the reason why people are reading Station Eleven. You know, it's been it's been an awful time. Uh, but I I'm really I am grateful for it. Yeah. You know, um, I, I can only imagine when you have such explosive success with a novel that writing the follow up novel. Maybe a little daunting. I, I don't. I, I. I don't know. But how did you approach your next novel, which is the one that we're talking about tonight, The Glass Hotel, after the major success of this? Station uh, you're right. It, it was a little daunting. It's approximately the least sympathetic problem in the entire world. So I try not to dwell on it. But um, you know, if you write a book that that is successful, that a lot of people read. And all of a sudden, there's this invisible audience looking over your shoulder as you're writing, you know, um, waiting for the next book. And I just never had that experience before. Station Eleven was my fourth novel, but the first three were published by very small presses, which is a nice way of saying that they didn't sell very many copies. Um, So, you know, I just had never had that experience before of the sense of a crowd waiting to see what I was going to write next. And I think that 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 did have some psychological impact that definitely slowed down the writing. Um, Having to sort of consciously block out that invisible crowd at every turn. And I want to be clear, there was no pressure from my publishers. They could not have been cooler or more hands-off about it, which I really appreciated. But yeah, it, it was, it was a thing to deal with. I bet because it's been five, six years since that novel yeah. came out, right? So, I mean, you also have had a child and, and all kinds mm-hmm. of things going on in your life. Um, now, the Glass Hotel itself, inspired by the crimes of Bernie Madoff and the massive Ponzi scheme, just tell us a bit what, what inspired you to write a book about that period of time and those particular crimes. Yeah, Types sure. Crimes. Yeah. Right, right. So something I like to emphasize is that every character in the book is fictional. So it's not actually a novel about Madoff or anybody around him. But I was fascinated by that crime. And it is essentially the same crime in the book. So the fascination for me was actually, it had to do with his staff. I think not a lot of people know this, but that was a $65 billion, with a B, U.S. Ponzi scheme. It's hard for one person to do that himself. And, you know, if you're a billionaire, you're not going to sit there formatting your own fake account statements. You know, you, you got people for that. So he had a staff of, I don't remember exactly, but I want to say about six or seven people who went to prison for um, their administrative role in the crime. And at the time that story broke, I had this really great day job for a writer. I was an administrative assistant in cancer research lab. And I really liked my coworkers. They were all scientists. They were really smart. 
And what I found myself thinking about was just the camaraderie that you have with any group of people who show up at work together every day. You know, that sense of shared mission and doing something together, even if you don't always love each other, you, you know, it's a, uh, you're a group. Now think of how much wilder and weirder and more intense that is. If you're showing up at work on Monday to perpetuate a massive crime, like that's your Monday morning routine. So I, I just found myself fascinated by the idea of that group of people. You know, what's, uh, what's the story you tell yourself to make that somehow okay? And then that kind of dovetails in an interesting way with mob mentality, which is a topic that interests me. And, you know, that's a pretty well-studied thing, that phenomenon where you will throw a brick through the window if you're in a crowd of 100 people doing the same thing. You would never dream of doing that, you know, as an individual if you weren't in the crowd. So the, uh, the first part of the book I ever wrote after a million rounds of revision eventually became, I think it's chapter 10, the, uh, the office chorus. And the first line of that chapter is, we had crossed a line. Because I think it's easier to say we crossed a line than I crossed a line. So yeah, that was uh, that was my initial point of fascination. You know, it's 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 interesting you mentioned the accomplices because that part felt so. I mean, it all did, but it felt so particularly authentic that you seem to capture their motivations and and how they went about this in in the office chorus. And when you talk about what interested you about this part of the part of the book, there was a reporter in, in your book that says, I've always had an interest in mass delusion. So that that's what you're talking about here. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was another thing that fascinated me about the crime is it seemed to me there were these kind of parallel tracks of mass delusion. Where on the one hand, there are the investors, the office chorus, who are telling themselves some story to make it possible to sleep at night. On the other hand, the investors. And, uh, you know, if we return to the, the inspiration for the, the crime, um, you know, a lot of Madoff investors didn't even know they were investing with Madoff. I think there's a popular misconception that it was all billionaires. Um, but there were a lot of everyday people who didn't know their retirement savings were in a fund, invested with a fund, invested in a Ponzi scheme. Um, but you know, there were other people, including somebody quite close to me who was an investor, who did know they were investing with Madoff, saw returns that made absolutely no sense, and just kind of went along with it. Because surely if something was wrong, somebody else would have said something by now, or you know, everybody was making money. Um, and I'm fascinated by that too. How you tell yourself certain things to make it all square. Exactly. Or, yeah. you know, the line a character has in the book, it's possible to know something and not know something at the same time. And I think that absolutely came into play with, with some of the investors. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, um, the, the, the character who was at the head of the Ponzi scheme, Jonathan Alcatus, um, a fictional character, as you point out, I want you to just describe him a little bit more because um, here he is pulling off this massive scheme to ruin people's lives, but he was also good to his trophy wife, who we will talk about, Vincent, and he was also mm -hmm. very kind to Olivia, one of these low-level investors. So how do you explain a ruthless crook like him and, and, and also being a guy that's kind of likable? Yeah. Um, you know, I have to go to sort of technical terms describing him. It's really hard to write a villain without making him this kind of two-dimensional mustache twirling Disney figure. And that was something I really struggled with, with writing Jonathan, is how do I make this guy interesting? Uh, because, you know, if you read, and as you pointed out, he's not Madoff, but if he is, you know, the crime's the same. And if you read interviews with Madoff from prison, he is a deeply uninteresting person. You know, he just seems like such a garden variety sociopath. So there wasn't really an interesting character for me to base Jonathan on. So I really struggled with that. And I felt like he had to be as kind and human as possible in order to be, I wouldn't even say likable, but just uh, worth reading about. You know, it's, uh, yeah, if he's pure evil, then he's not believable. So that was something I struggled with. And I do like that idea, not just, um, I guess just kind of in life in general, not just fictional characters, that it's possible to be absolutely horrendous in one way, but quite lovely in another. 
you know, the person who's incredibly abusive to one person in their life, but they treat other people beautifully. You know, that, uh, that's an interesting phenomenon. So yeah, that was, that was how I, how I ended up getting to that character. Okay. Um, you know, he, was interesting and also i mean when you talk about contrast where where his he's doing these awful things but he's he's you know worth reading about but there's also a massive contrast between the settings new york city and this hotel this remote hotel that he owned on an island off the coast of british columbia tell me about those two settings and where they came from new york Absolutely, obviously yeah. but the, the other one the other one, um, I wish that the Hotel Kayad existed in the world. Um, I did an epic promotional tour for Station Eleven, and I was actually doing uh, paid lectures and onstage conversations for that book. Well, I actually still am. I had uh, I had to reschedule a couple when the pandemic hit, um, which is another way of saying that I've stayed in an unbelievable number of hotels over the last six years or whatever it's been. And I think at one point, you know, probably by you know, well staying at a Best Western by an expressway in Texas somewhere. I uh, I just started thinking, well, what is my ideal hotel? Is there a perfect hotel I could imagine? And the Hotel Cayette came out of that. What I was thinking about is the way a really great hotel, it's kind of a self-contained world. You sort of feel like you could get anything. Um, and there's a sort of magic just in room service, which, you know, I probably betray my working class upbringing by saying that. But it's magical that you can call a number and a sandwich appears in your room. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. Uh, so, you know, just little things like that. And it seemed to me that it might be kind of interesting as a juxtaposition to have this very grand, very expensive hotel in an absolutely incongruous setting. So for the setting, the, uh, the hamlet of Kayette, I was thinking about Quatsino, British Columbia, which I would not say I know very well, but I spent a couple of weeks there as a teenager and I really loved it. It's very much the way I describe the fictional hamlet or village in the book. It's, um, I want to say 85 people. It's deep in an inlet at the north end of Vancouver Island. You, uh, you drive to Port Hardy and then it's like 20 minutes on gravel roads. And then you get in a boat because the roads end. You know, it's that kind of place. Um, it just made a really big impression on me. It's so beautiful and so remote. And living there requires such incredible commitment to wilderness and commitment to living off the grid. So it just it grabbed my attention as a teenager, and I'd been wanting to write about it. And it seemed like a beautifully incongruous place for a hotel like that. Yeah. Wow. And it's, it, is, it is magical to sort of imagine yourself at this place, and you describe it so perfectly. And, and you did grow up on Denman Island, so you, you did, know the yeah. area very well. I do. I do know it very well. And, you know, you were talking about settings in a more general sense a moment ago. Um, I... I do find myself most comfortable writing about places where I've actually lived because it's just, it's so easy to get it wrong. Um, mm. And when I'm writing about a place I haven't lived, I change the name to slightly cover myself if I <laughs> make any horrible mistakes, um, <laughs> which is probably why it's Cayette, not Quatsino. But okay. uh, yeah, I, yeah, I grew up on Demon Island and I've been in New York City for, I want to say 17 years. It goes fast. So yeah, they're just uh, locations I'm very familiar with. Wow. Um, Emily, let me ask you about Vincent, you know, the, the, the main the main character. Let's talk about her for, for a bit. Um, she was the bartender at Hotel Cayette. She meets mm -hmm. Jonathan Alcatis, and we'll talk about that in, uh, in a second. But her name, uh, and she's named after Edna St. Vincent Millay, the Pulitzer Prize winning poet of the 1920s, also a very active feminist activist at the time. Vincent is named after her. Why did you pick that name? Um, I really love Edna St. Vincent Millay's work. That's part of it. And probably actually a lot of listeners who don't think they're familiar with her work probably are. She's the one who wrote that little poem. I burn my candle at both ends. It will not last the night. But oh, my friends and ah, my foes. It gives a lovely light. You know, we, that's one of those poems where I had no idea she'd written it. I'd known it forever. Um, I like her work. But more important, she had this kind of singular, sort of ferocious character that reminded me of Vincent, or maybe I based Vincent a little bit after her. Her upbringing, so she grew up in a pretty desperate poverty in Maine, and she 
catapulted herself into a new life with her poetry, kind of by sheer force of will, which is very much Vincent's um, situation, you know, in the book, where, you know, Edna St. Vincent Millay, she wrote a poem when she was 17, submitted it to a contest in New York City. It didn't win, but it caught the attention of judges, which somehow catapulted her into Vassar College and just this, this whole new way of living. And I liked the idea of, uh, of echoing that a little bit in my fictional character of Vincent's story of, um, you know, somebody who obviously chooses a very different route to a new life, but nonetheless, there is that kind of, uh, that act of will, I guess you would say. So tell me about that a little bit more because Vincent, she, she, we, we get to know her a little bit and then she, she's the much younger woman to Jonathan Alcatis. She becomes the trophy wife, capitalizing on her, on her beauty and her smarts to make that kind of choice. But did she ultimately have power and control over her own life once she made that decision? I was wondering about the decision you made to yeah. make her that way. Yeah, um, that was an interesting thing to write about. So to back up a little bit to sort of her origin, what, what I realized pretty early on is that if you're going to write about a massive financial crime, you're writing about money. So that became kind of an organizing principle of the book because I wanted every section of the book, and there are these multiple sections with different points of view, uh, to be in some way about money, which is kind of an interesting topic to me. And I've always just been really interested in the phenomenon of trophy wives as a sort of economic phenomenon where, you know, it's a very mercenary trade that they're making. Um, you can judge it morally. I don't. I think, uh, you know, that's, that's one way to, uh, to get a life that you want, I suppose. Um, so I just really liked the idea of a wildly intelligent trophy wife who knows exactly what she's doing, has made a very clear-eyed choice about her life. And then the way that kind of plays out in her relationship, I feel like in fiction, often marriages or romantic relationships more generally are kind of, uh, you know, they're either horrendous or they're great. Um, it's kind of interesting to think of a sort of middle ground where she's not in love with Jonathan, but she really does enjoy his company and, you know, thinks he's a good conversationalist and it's fine. It's absolutely fine. And she has this, sort of magical life that she never could have imagined. So yeah, I, uh, I found all of that really interesting to write about. I, I think I'd probably call her my favorite character. Yeah, she is very compelling. Now, when you say you're interested in themes of money, why do you say that? What, what interests you about that? Well, I think maybe partly that it's so taboo in such a weird way. You know, we're not supposed to talk about money. It's like, it's impolite. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, I did come from a very working class background. And to be clear, I have no complaints. Like it was a great upbringing with a lot of books in it. But what that means, you know, if you don't have enough money, then you're constantly thinking about money. It's this constant calculus running through your head. And that was particularly vivid after I left home when I was a dance student in Toronto. You know, just that constant thing. Well, you know, if I go home on the subway, I have to pay for the Metro card. Um, I probably had a different name in Toronto. I don't remember anymore. But, you know, I had to pay for the Metro. Uh, if I pay for the Metro, will I have money for breakfast tomorrow? Just like the tedious, constant calculations about everything. So for Vincent, the condition of not having to do that anymore, the condition of not having to think about money is just absolutely revelatory. It just frees up an incredible amount of space in her mind. Hmm. So yeah, I probably, probably that's where my interest in the topic comes from. It's just my upbringing. Um, at this point, uh, my financial situation is much easier and the, you know, the condition of moving from one class to another, it does feel oddly like immigration sometimes, you know, I, I'll, I'll sometimes come up against cultural differences when I'm talking to people who've always been middle-class or who grew up with quite a bit of money. And I don't mean that in any kind of a derogatory way. It's just, there's a totally different frame of reference, a totally different understanding of what you expect from the world and how you expect it to work. If you've grown up with a safety net versus not. And that's, uh, you know, that's something that interests me. Wow. I, I mean, I, the, and you've, you've talked about it in inter other interviews about station 11, the impact that that success had on your life and allowed you 
uh, to imagine things for yourself, perhaps that you didn't before. Can you just tell me a bit about how it how it changed your your circumstances? That that success. Yeah. Um, you know the most. The, the biggest thing is it allowed me to quit my day job, which I never in a million years imagined I'd be able to do. I was a, a part-time administrative assistant at the Rockefeller University in New York, and it was a really great day job with cheap health insurance, which, of course, if you're in the U.S., it's like the first consideration in everything. It's kind of crazy. Um, I really liked it in a lot of ways, and I was completely at peace with doing it forever. I, you know, it was absolutely a dead-end job. There was nowhere you'd go from there in the institution. And that was fine. I uh, I could get by, and I had health insurance and uh, time to write. So yeah, it had just never occurred to me that I wouldn't always have a day job until Station Eleven. And you know, I probably, to be honest, I probably held on to that job for much longer than made sense. I didn't quit that job until a year after Station Eleven came out, and it, it just it got a little crazy. I remember. I remember this very strange period where, you know, one day I had to leave work early because I had a photo shoot at Time Magazine, for example. <laughs> and there was a long period with, during the paperback tour for Station Eleven. Um, one of my jobs, you know, I was an admin, is, was booking my boss's travel. So I was constantly buying plane tickets for my boss. But I didn't book my own travel. I had three publicists who were dealing with that. Um, and then finally, I, I reached my breaking point around my third tour of the UK, where my memory of the moment is it was midnight on a Sunday in a hotel room in London. And I was like booking plane tickets for my boss. <laughs> I was like, this just has to stop. This is getting crazy. Um, and then I found out I was pregnant. And I remember thinking, you know what? I could raise a kid and have a day job or have a day job and write or raise a kid and write, but I can't do all three. That's, that, was, that was too much. So yeah, I finally let it go, which was absolutely terrifying. But it's, uh, yeah, it, it was the right decision. It took yeah, it's me a long kind of time worked to out. Work. It's kind of worked out. So far, yeah. Yeah, yeah fingers crossed. <laughs> Emily, have you always wanted to be a writer? Did you imagine this for yourself when you were growing up? And if not, when did this come to you that you would write write books and successful books? Um, I didn't think they'd be successful. <laughs> no, I, uh, I was a dancer. That was my first career. Um. And, you know, I, I grew up in a pretty rural place, but Denman Island, you know, it's rural, but it's not remote. It's a 10 minute ferry ride to Vancouver Island. And then it was a 45 minute drive south to Parksville, which had Parksville Ballet School, which is a fantastic dance school. It, it's really, or it was at the time when I went to it, really surprisingly good. So I got a really good dance training from an early age and at first, I was one of those little girls who's absolutely dead set on becoming a ballerina. Uh, but ballet is obviously impossible. So I, um, I switched to modern dance. And when I was 18, I went to uh, the School of Toronto Dance Theatre, a conservatory program in Toronto, which was wonderful. It's a three-year program. Uh, but to back up a little bit, I'd been writing all my life by that point. So as we talked about earlier, I was homeschooled as a kid. And one of the very few requirements of the curriculum was that I had to write something every day. So I was in the habit of writing from a really early age, these little poems and short, short stories that I never showed to anybody. I kept doing it long after the point where I had to do it because I just really loved it. I found I loved writing. And then there was a moment when I was about 21 or 22, I'd graduated from the School of Toronto Dance Theater and was living in Montreal. And I realized that somewhere along the way, dance had stopped being fun. There was just no joy in it anymore for some reason. It, it was like something had let go of me. Um, and so I found myself thinking, well, what comes next? I had no college degree because that was a non-degree granting program, Contemporary Dance. I had a mountain of student loan debt from that, so it never occurred to me to go back to school. I, uh, I had a job putting price stickers on martini glasses and like unpacking boxes in a warehouse, and I didn't want to do that forever. Like it was fine, but not as a long-term thing. So um, yeah, it was around that time I started thinking, well, what comes next? And I decided to try to take the writing more seriously and to uh, to start thinking of it as a career and started writing what eventually became my first novel, Last Night in Montreal. And the rest is history. I mean, you just kept plugging away and this this felt like the right thing. 
Yeah, it felt like yeah. the right thing. Um, it was hard. It was really hard at the beginning. My first novel was rejected by, I want to say like 35 publishers. Um, yeah, I spent two years getting rejected by every publisher in New York City. Um, and like all the ones outside New York City. And then finally landed at a tiny independent press in the US. And then that uh, led to Canadian distribution with a tiny, now defunct Canadian press. So yeah, it was pretty hard scrabble at first. Um, I could piece together a living with these little advances plus administrative work. And I just assumed that would be the program forever. Um, yeah, Station Eleven was something I couldn't have seen coming. Wow. So back to back to the Glass Hotel for 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 a, a couple more minutes. Um, you know, one of the other themes or the the what I the sense I really got from the book was this feeling of loss, um, the loss of of loved ones, of relationships, of money, of dreams, of family lost to dysfunction, and there seems to be that a lot of sadness in these relationships. What are we meant to take from that? What do we learn from that? That's interesting. I guess I saw it a little bit differently. Um, as less about sadness and more about hauntedness, you know, and the different permutations that takes where, you know, on the one hand, you could be haunted in that kind of classical, creaky Victorian mansion kind of a way, you know, the sort of specter wafting down the hallway. But then also the thought of being haunted by decisions you wish you'd made or hadn't made or, you know, the sort of ghosts of relationships that we all carry with us. Um, yeah, or the counter life, that idea that comes up in the book of being haunted by the ghost of the life you didn't live. Yeah, I'll have to think about that idea of sadness. That wasn't something I was explicitly thinking about, but... That's not to say it isn't there. Right. I, I mean, I guess I felt that way also with, with Vincent's relationship with her half-brother Paul and, and his life and the decisions he made. Um, the life, they seem lonely and they seem disconnected mm -hmm. from, from each other without a real, you know, center relationship in all of them. And, right. and maybe to me that right. co connotes um, sadness. And that's, that's yeah, what I'm that, putting on that's it. That's totally valid. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's hard to connect with people. Um I was going to say even your own family, but obviously sometimes, especially your own family, you know, we've all been to Thanksgiving dinners. Um, yeah, it's, it's just not easy. Um, two of the characters, well, Vincent and her brother, Paul, we haven't talked about a lot here. They also stumble into, and we've touched on it a, a bit in, in our conversation tonight, they've stumbled onto unexpected lives of success and fame. Paul also through shady means, which which um, uh, which we learn about in there. But Vincent also through a conscious through a conscious choice. Why do those themes resonate with you? Just this idea of unexpected right. fabulousness. Um, my, uh, I don't know that I'd bring fabulousness up to the surface in this, but I'm definitely living a life I never would have imagined. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I don't have a college degree. I also don't have a high school diploma. And, and here I am living in a foreign country where I never would have imagined living when I was a kid, doing work for which I haven't trained. I've, I've never taken a writing workshop. You know, I trained in Canada as a contemporary dancer, and I'm somehow a novelist in New York City. And I'm not really sure how that happened, but it did. So yeah, I think uh, that's maybe left me with an abiding fascination with the condition of of landing in a life that seems implausible. Yeah, yeah, and and it's it's infused some of your some of your characters. Um, so you know, I wanted to to ask one more question that it seems to I don't know in, in in, encapsulate Station Eleven and the Glass Hotel somehow as two worlds colliding. When Bernie Madoff in the last few months asked for early release because he feels he is susceptible to the virus, to COVID, mm -hmm. while in jail. What do you make of that? And what is your position on forgiveness? Is this something that, that should be considered? Yeah. That's a tough one. It's something that I've grappled with, in his case particularly, but also in the case of other convicted criminals, without always really coming up with a clear answer. You know, I'm trying to just uh, live in that uh, that ambiguity. His crime was horrific. It uh, it ruined lives. People committed suicide after it. 
Um, but then the question of, well, does that mean that society is somehow better served by a man with kidney failure getting COVID-19 in jail? Like, no. <laughs> so I, I really don't know is the honest answer. It's uh, it's something I've thought about a lot without really coming to a clear conclusion. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, it, it is, it is something that, that, um, you know, we've, we at, it was a, it was a big conversation during during COVID whether or not prisons should be open, uh, and to let, you know, non-threatening criminals out. But Madoff himself asked for it, so um, I, I thought that maybe there was a bit of ex exploration around the idea of forgiveness in in some of the courtroom scenes with a position of of uh, Jonathan Alcades's lawyer um, exploring whether or not uh, you know there should be forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, that was interesting to try to put myself in the shoes of a lawyer doing an impossible job. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how they do it. Um, and you know, it's, I feel like it's much easier to make a case for forgiveness now when he's been in jail since, I don't know, uh, 2009. Um, and he's in ill health and we're in a pandemic. Like it's much easier to make that case now than it was then, you know, or, than it was for my fictional character who committed the same crime, where, you know, in that case, I found Madoff's sentence appropriate, as insane as it was. He, sent, he was sentenced to 150 years um, with, and this is kind of hilarious, three years of probation following the sentence, <laughs> but yeah, American justice. Um, so yeah, you know, and that seemed to me to be appropriate, just given the magnitude of the pain that he inflicted. But yeah, now it's much more ambiguous. Hmm. Well, Emily, I want to say thank you so much for these two books that I've that I've had a chance to read over the last last month. Um, you are such a gifted writer, and it is really yeah. a pleasure to spend time with your characters, and now after tonight with you. So thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Alrighty.